The inclusion of any material quoted, paraphrased, discussed, cited, or otherwise referenced within this program or its references does not represent any endorsement whatsoever, express or implied, of this program by any author or source of any such material. Those who favor and promote Medicaid estate recovery see the practice strictly as a means of recovering the cost of operating Medicaid long-term care programs and of offering extended Medicaid coverage pursuant to the Affordable Care Act. Those who oppose Medicaid estate recovery view it as a discriminatory disability-based surtax in cases involving Medicaid long-term care recipients targeted by the practice in its original scope and as a discriminatory poverty-based surtax in cases involving recipients of extended Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act who are targeted by the states that choose to carry out the practice beyond its original scope. The proponents of Medicaid estate recovery often cite the high cost of operating Medicaid long-term care programs in justifying the practice. Opponents of Medicaid estate recovery see the practice as a violation of the civil rights of people with disabilities, pointing out that virtually all other federal, state, local, and private efforts and programs benefiting people with disabilities are paid for with standard revenue sources without going after the estates of individuals with disabilities. Programs and efforts benefiting other minorities at all levels are also paid for from standard revenue sources without going after the estates of individual minority members. Health, the ultimately absolute gatekeeper of opportunity. It can truly be said that a person's health is the ultimately absolute gatekeeper of opportunity in the sense that being able to take advantage of any and all opportunities in life is contingent upon whether a person is healthy enough to be able to do so. This is a fact that truly applies across the board to each and every one of us. This is the one truth that applies to each of us regardless of our age, gender, race, color, religion, nationality, sexual orientation, and regardless of whether we are a person with a disability or not. Regardless of financial or social status, anyone who has had to carry out life's activities of learning, working, and so on at their residence or elsewhere while dealing with a minor or chronic illness and not feeling well truly knows the absolute misery of the experience. And anyone who is or has been ill enough to not have the energy or stamina to do hardly anything well knows the frustration of not being able to perform life's activities as usual during that time. And anyone who ends up dying due to illness or injury is no longer around to take advantage of any opportunities at all. So, yes, health is indeed the ultimately absolute gatekeeper of opportunity. Aside from one's own efforts to stay healthy, Health care is the absolutely indispensable means of being able to catch early and overcome any medical issues. All of us are in absolute need of health care in order to be able to take advantage of the various opportunities in life. Anyone who lacks access to sufficient health care also suffers to some degree loss of opportunities. In its news article entitled COVID-19 Pandemic Highlights Long-Standing Health Inequities in the U.S., the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health cites its social epidemiology professor, Nancy Krieger, as having listed a variety of factors that put people of color at greater risk on the virus. They are more likely to live in crowded conditions, to work in service jobs that put them in close proximity to others, to have to go to work because they can't afford to miss it to take public transportation, and to lack access to protective gear at work. They are also more likely to have pre-existing conditions that increase the risk from COVID-19 and to lack access to health care and health insurance. A Harvard study noted air pollution as an additional COVID-19 risk to people of color. 
While U.S. healthcare history is replete with the progress of scientific and medical discoveries and in how these have resulted in many modern medical marvels, we're going to look at the portion of U.S. healthcare history in which medical care has either been denied entirely or has been limited in scope and quality to individuals of color. The pay for your own health care structure of the U.S. health care system results in many individuals not being able to get health insurance or medical care because they can't afford it. This often results in Americans living in fear of medical bankruptcy and losing their possessions. This also results in many on Medicaid living in fear of Medicaid estate recovery. Just as the fears of Medicaid estate recovery are all too often realized, as discussed in Episode 1, the fears of medical bankruptcy are all too often realized as well. I'm living on the street now. How many Americans fall into medical bankruptcy? An article published in The Guardian on November 14, 2019. Citing the fact that having health insurance is not enough to save Americans from massive debt when serious illness strikes, the article discusses a woman with cancer and $52,000 of medical debt at risk of having to file a second medical bankruptcy. Also featured among others is a diabetic amputee who now lives on the street because of medical debt. A February 2019 study is cited documenting some 530,000 bankruptcies due at least in part to medical debt filed yearly. The study indicates that bankruptcies involving medical debt to any degree amount to about 60% of all bankruptcies. The article also mentions another lady who has already filed for medical bankruptcy twice after she was hospitalized for pneumonia and sarcoidosis and had to have lung surgery. Yet another lady dealing with a seizure disorder has accumulated thousands of dollars in medical bills she cannot pay. The homeless diabetic amputee mentioned previously had about $400,000 in medical debt hanging over him. All of these people had insurance that clearly did not cover all their costs. A fact these people were surprised by after assuming they were fully covered by their health insurance plans. The private for-profit health insurance industry, like so much of the for-profit American health care system, places the protection of its profits above all else, which means collecting as much in the way of premiums as possible and paying out as little in claims as possible. The spectrum of health insurance plans offered ranges from those with relatively low premiums, having high deductibles, high co-pays, many exclusions, and low percentages of payment for covered medical expense costs, to plans with very high premiums, with lower deductibles, lower co-pays, relatively few exclusions, and higher percentages of payment for covered medical costs. It is no wonder that Americans are at risk of medical bankruptcy whether they can even afford health insurance or not. There are many who say that many problems with health care in the U.S. would be solved if the U.S. adopted a tax-supported single-payer health care system like those in some other nations. They say Americans would no longer have to live in fear of bankruptcy or of Medicaid estate recovery. So we'll compare U.S. health care with that of four other nations, comparing the positives and negatives to see if this is so. We will make this comparison after our discussions of U.S. healthcare history and Commonality 6, Inequities in Minority Healthcare. U.S. Healthcare History Of all the details of U.S. healthcare history, we will narrow our focus to how the current disparities in current U.S. healthcare developed. John C. Calhoun is characterized as perhaps the most prominent political theorist of the slaveholding South and an influence on modern right-wing thinking. In an illustration caption in an article entitled, American Democracy Has Never Shed an Undemocratic Assumption Present at Its Founding, That Some People Are Inherently More Entitled to Power Than Others. This article was featured in the August 18, 2019 issue of the New York Times Magazine, the 1619 Project issue, pages 50 through 55. Calhoun envisioned a government that would protect only the liberty of the master, the liberty of those who claimed a right to property and a position at the top of a racial and economic hierarchy. This liberty, Calhoun stated, was a reward to be earned, 
not a blessing to be gratuitously lavished on all alike, a reward reserved for the intelligent, the patriotic, the virtuous and deserving, and not a boon to be bestowed on a people too ignorant, degraded, and vicious to be capable of appreciating or enjoying it. It is notable that Calhoun's views of African Americans and other people of color were based on medical myths which pro-slavery doctors sought to prove through bizarre and horrible experiments. The myths regarding African Americans and the cruel medical experiments on them are discussed extensively in an article entitled Myths Regarding Physical Racial Differences Were Used to Justify Slavery and Are Still Believed by Doctors Today. This article is featured on pages 56 and 57 of the New York Times Magazine 1619 Project issue dated August 18, 2019. Extremely excruciating blistering experiments were conducted on African-American slave John Brown by Dr. Thomas Hamilton in an effort to prove that African-American skin was thicker than the skin of white people. These experiments were detailed by John Brown in his 1855 autobiography, Slave Life in Georgia, a narrative of the life, sufferings, and escape of John Brown, a fugitive slave now in England. Dr. Benjamin Mosley, in his 1787 A Treatise on Tropical Diseases and on the Climate of the West Indies, that African Americans could tolerate extremely painful surgeries that white people were totally incapable of tolerating. The myths about African American pain tolerance were not only seized upon by slavery proponents, but these myths also fostered even more medical cruelty including excruciating and what would today be unconscionable gynecological surgeries in Montgomery, Alabama between 1845 and 1849 on African-American women conducted by Dr. J. Marion Sims, long celebrated as the father of modern gynecology without any anesthesia whatsoever, all documented in Dr. Sims' autobiography, The Story of My Life. Thomas Jefferson published Notes on the State of Virginia, around 1787, in which he proposed a list of the real distinctions which nature has made regarding African Americans. While the two most persistent myths promoted regarding African Americans continued to be those regarding increased pain tolerance and reduced lung capacity, other myths were promoted by physicians and scientists as well. As an example, Dr. Samuel Cartwright stated that runaway slaves had a mental condition he called drapomania and recommended whipping the devil out of drapomaniacs as a cure. Along with these assertions, he wrote many of the other disease categorizations and encouraged forced labor as a means of correcting the problem of reduced lung capacity. The doctor's assertions appeared in a well-publicized report on the diseases and physical peculiarities of the Negro in the May 1851 New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal. The Myths article concludes by mentioning that in modern times assertions of Dr. Cartwright are regarded as satire, the experiments of Dr. Hamilton are regarded as sadistic, and a statue of Dr. Sims was recently removed from New York City's Central Park following numerous extended protests by women and others. However, everything from the race correction programmed into lung function testing spirometers to how some doctors and medical students apparently still believe some of the myths regarding African Americans to how pain management for African Americans is often not performed with the same diligence and equality as others illustrates how the baseless medical myths regarding African Americans of the past continue to affect the policy and practice of medicine. An article entitled why doesn't the United States have universal health care? The answer begins with policies enacted after the Civil War. Appears on pages 44 and 45 of the New York Times Magazine 1619 Project issue dated August 18, 2019. This article describes in more detail how, in numerous instances, the same powerful voting bloc within Congress mentioned in Episode 2, consisting of senators and congressmen from the South, applied over numerous decades the earlier views of John Calhoun as it worked to prevent people of color from getting health care equal to that of whites, 
and or to prevent them from getting health care at all. John Calhoun had advocated that states should nullify or invalidate any federal laws with which they do not agree. After the Civil War, vaccination and quarantine techniques that had been used to prevent mass smallpox outbreaks among Union troops were denied to encampments of African Americans and other people of color. According to historian Jim Downs in his 2012 book, Sick from Freedom, white leaders were hesitant to intervene, torn between anxiety over smallpox epidemics spilling into white communities, wanting African Americans to be healthy to return to plantation work, and fear of healthy African Americans upending the racial hierarchy. Downs details the dispatching of a mere 120 or so doctors throughout the war-torn South as part of the medical division of the Freedmen's Bill, and how pleas for more personnel and equipment were ignored. White legislators argued that free assistance of any kind would breed dependence, and that when it came to African American infirmity, hard labor was a better salve than white medicine. As the death toll rose, they developed a new theory. African Americans were so ill-suited for freedom that the entire race was going extinct. As Columbia University historian Ira Katznelson and others have documented, it was at the behest of Southern Democrats that people of color were excluded from New Deal policies like the Social Security, Wagner, and Fair Labor Standards Acts, as discussed in Episode 2, and also engaged in the efforts regarding health care of people of color we are discussing here. Southern legislators in Congress obtained concessions under the 1946 Hill-Burton Act that allowed them to segregate hospitals constructed with Hill-Burton funding. The American Medical Association, medical schools, and most hospitals and clinics excluded African-American doctors, medical students, and patients, respectively. Temple University Emeritus Health Care Policy historian David Barton Smith said regarding employer-based health insurance, they were denied most of the jobs that offered coverage, and even when some of them got health insurance, they couldn't make use of white facilities. In light of being partially or totally excluded from health care, African Americans formed their own health care systems, including health education and fundraising efforts to construct African American health facilities. African American doctors and nurses formed their own professional associations, carrying out a war against medical apartheid and calling for a federal health program for all citizens. The National Medical Association of African American Doctors fought against the American Medical Association, which repeatedly opposed nationalized health care. Although calling the idea of nationalized health care for all citizens, socialist and un-American, had worked for the American Medical Association in previous battles, the counter-message of the National Medical Association of health care as a basic human right eventually resulted in the development of the Medicare and Medicaid programs. These programs, along with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, brought the segregation of medical facilities to an end. The passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010 resulted in increased health insurance coverage for about 20 million Americans, although some 30 million plus Americans remain uninsured to date. The article then concludes, 150 years after the freed people of the South first petitioned the government for basic medical care, the United States remains the only high-income country in the world where such care is not guaranteed to every citizen. In the United States, racial health disparities have proven as fundamental as democracy itself. There has never been any period in American history where the health of blacks has been equal to that of whites. Evelyn Hammonds, a historian of science at Harvard University, says disparity is built into the system. Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act helped shrink those disparities, but no federal health plan yet has eradicated them. Commonality 6. Inequities in Minority Health Care We just discussed the health care disparities that people of color have experienced and continue to experience in health care in the U.S. Health Care History section. 
The six commonalities shared by the people with disabilities civil rights movements with other civil rights movements lies in the fact that people with disabilities have also experienced health care disparities as well. In episode two, we briefly summarized the history of people with disabilities in the United States while discussing commonality two, overall pattern of minority struggles. That the care of people with disabilities without families in the U.S. was initially farmed out to the lowest bidder. The sometimes fatal neglect and abuse of their charges by some caretakers set the stage for reform. The Accommodating the Spectrum of Individual Abilities publication by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights was the source for much of our summarization of the history of people with disabilities in the Episode 2, Commonality 2 section. The fact that the medical profession, among its other acts toward people with disabilities, was very much involved in the widespread custodial institutionalization of people with disabilities in mass warrants discussion here. The accommodating publication briefly discusses the almshouse system before moving on to its discussion of institutions. Beginning on page 19, the publication reads, Based partly on state legislative reports criticizing prior approaches as inefficient, in the early 1820s, public programs shifted to more organized institutional care for indigent and handicapped people. Although some facilities provided care for people with particular types of handicaps, the typical approach that emerged was to confine handicapped people in almshouses or poorhouses, along with juvenile delinquents, prostitutes, elderly people, and poor people. Most of these facilities were merely custodial, and many were unsanitary and overcrowded. Concerns over the inadequacies of the local almshouse system prompted reformers like Dorothea Dix to push for state supervision of institutional facilities and for more specialized care. As a result, in the 1850s, state facilities for various groups of handicapped people proliferated amid high hopes that training and education would allow people to leave the institutions and live in their own communities. Although these programs apparently achieved some success, they were largely replaced between 1870 and 1890 by facilities operating on a new model focused on protecting handicapped people from society. This philosophy emphasized benevolent shelter and resulted in large institutions housing great numbers of disabled people far from population centers. These programs generally provided no training that might enable handicapped residents to return to their communities. Some residents were taught skills such as farming, but only to defray institutional costs. Ironically, the protective isolation model premiered upon a belief that handicapped people needed to be protected from the hardships incident to normal society was replaced in the late 1800s and early 1900s by a growing sentiment that society needed protection from handicapped people. The social Darwinism of the late 19th century spawned a eugenics movement which peaked in the United States in the 1920s. This movement was based on the notion that mental and physical disabilities were the underlying source of all social problems and were occurring with ever-increasing frequency due to reproduction by unfit persons. Some observers saw the spreading of handicapping conditions through heredity as the single most serious problem facing America. Handicapped people were referred to as mere animals, subhuman creatures, and waste products who were draining the economy and were producing only pauperism, degeneracy, and crime. To isolate handicapped people, some professionals advocated institutionalization even for minor disabling conditions. The cost of maintaining institutions, however, soon became burdensome for many communities. Reducing per capita costs allowed institutions to admit more people on a given budget. These economics of scale fostered large understaffed institutions providing minimal custodial services to residents. By the end of the 1920s, scientists had discredited many of the underpinnings of eugenics, and the belief that handicapped people were a social menace waned. Experts challenged the eugenicist emphasis on heredity as a cause of disabilities, and refuted theories that the human race was deteriorating genetically. <laughs> 
This undercut the primary rationale for segregating handicapped people from the rest of society. But the large state institutions had established a momentum of their own. Institutionalization had become America's automatic response to the question of how to deal with the handicapped population. Whether young or old, whether borderline or profoundly retarded, whether physically handicapped or physically sound, whether deaf or blind, whether rural or urban, whether from the local town or 500 miles away, whether well-behaved or ill-behaved, we took them all by the thousands, 5,000 to 6,000 in some institutions. We had all the answers in one place. Using the same facilities, the same personnel, the same attitudes, and largely the same treatment. From this information, starting at the beginning of the text of page 19, and including about one-fifth of the main text on page 21, some common elements can already be seen. There were mistaken myths about minorities of color and about people with disabilities. Both groups were segregated, minorities of color from whites and people with disabilities from society at large. As noted in the text, the medical professionals would recommend institutionalization even for minor handicapping conditions in any case in which the person with the disability had not already died of their condition or for other reasons. There were numerous cases in which medical professionals refused to provide medical care to people with disabilities, including infants and children. One notable occurrence affecting several children with disabilities was in 1915 when Dr. Harry Hazelden, the chief surgeon at the German American Hospital in Chicago, refused to perform needed surgery on several children with severe birth defects and allowed them to die in an act of eugenics. All except one of the children are known to have died from lack of treatment. Although Dr. Hazelden prescribed a narcotic to ease and speed the death of the one, the child mother stopped giving the drugs amid public pressure to stop. The ultimate fate of the child remains unknown. The Chicago Medical Society ultimately threatened to expel Dr. Hazelden. A trial jury acquitted Dr. Hazelden. The Chicago Medical Board threw him out of practice following his lecture series on eugenics and his promotion of the 1917 silent film, The Black Stork, which profiled the case of one of the boys. Psychiatrist Henry Cotton at the Trenton State Hospital in New Jersey removed numerous body parts, teeth, tonsils, etc., from patients because he was convinced mental illness was caused by toxins. Sociologist Andrew Skull notes that Dr. Cotton's obsession with local sepsis persisted despite all evidence to the contrary. Despite some detractors, the medical profession did not renounce or discipline Dr. Cotton. Researchers from the Quaker Oats Company, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard University conducted research on mentally challenged children at the Walter E. Fairmount State School to see how well minerals from cereals were metabolized. The project was sold to the parents of the children as a science club with the children as members having special privileges while participating in the research. While the parents were told the children would be fed a diet high in nutrients, the parents were not informed, either verbally or on the consent form, that the nutrients contained radioactive calcium and iron. Lawsuits would later be filed because of the experiments. The lawsuits were eventually settled on December 31, 1997. In our discussion of Commonality 6 thus far, we established earlier that mistaken myths have circulated about minorities of color and people with disabilities alike, and that both groups have been subjected to segregation. And with the discussion just concluded with respect to experimentation on people with disabilities, albeit with only two out of the many instances that have occurred, we have also established that minorities of color and people with disabilities alike have been used as subjects of medical experimentation. Just as we wrapped up our earlier U.S. healthcare history discussion by citing current health care disparities faced by minorities of color, we will now wrap up this discussion by covering the current health care disparities faced by people with disabilities.
On its pages 35 and 36, the Accommodating the Spectrum of Individual Abilities publication, extensively quoted from earlier, states the following in its extent of handicap discrimination with respect to medical treatment. Handicapped people also face discrimination in the availability and delivery of medical services. While occasional denials of routine medical treatment have been reported, a much more serious problem involves the apparent withholding of life-saving medical treatment from individuals, frequently infants, solely because they are handicapped. Recently, widely publicized denials of medical treatment to infants occurred in Indiana, Illinois, and in California. In response to these incidents, President Reagan directed the Attorney General and the Secretary of Health and Human Services to notify all hospitals receiving federal financial assistance that failure to provide medical services because a person is handicapped constitutes discrimination prohibited by federal law. Attempts to secure medical treatment for handicapped children have resulted in a number of court cases. Another problem involves the imposition of drastic medical procedures upon handicapped people without their consent. Non-consensual electroconvulsive therapy, electroshock, psychosurgery, and the administration of psychotropic drugs have generated particular controversy and litigation. In addition, handicapped persons have been used as subjects for medical experimentation and as an easily exploited source of organ transplants. That's where the situation stood as of the release date of accommodating, September 1983. Today, just as many medical professionals still believe the mistaken myths about African Americans and other people of color, many medical professionals likewise believe many of the mistaken myths regarding people with disabilities as well. Like minorities of color, People with disabilities often find themselves not being able to afford health insurance, and sometimes they cannot obtain public health insurance either. Those people with disabilities who are on private or public health insurance are often denied needed services or equipment by insurers. Health Care in Five Nations A Comparison We indicated earlier that Following our discussion of U.S. health care history and inequities in minority health care, we would compare the health care systems of five nations. The PBS NewsHour special, Critical Care, America vs. the World, released in April 2021, did just that. The program examined the health care systems in the United States, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Australia, and Canada. Key points regarding each health care system were featured along with commentary from two top U.S. health care experts, Sein Mei Cheng of Princeton University and Dr. Ashish Jha, Dean of Brown University's School of Public Health. The program is narrated by correspondent William Branham, who spoke with Ms. Cheng, Dr. Jha, and a number of other interviewees. United States Houston residents, mostly African Americans, just a few miles away from the Texas Medical Center campus, die an average of 20 years earlier than other Houston residents. Pandemic aside, the U.S. spends about $3.8 trillion per year on health care. It is about a fifth of the nation's economy, with a percentage of gross domestic product twice that of other high-income nations. Americans die of preventable and treatable diseases at higher rates than those in other high-income countries. The U.S. system is often called the most expensive, least effective health care system in the modern world. Lack of health insurance or the high cost of health care is a barrier to millions. One in three Americans polled in 2020, including those with insurance, skipped medical treatment because of money. According to the most recent data, 30 million Americans, about 12% of those under 65, have no health insurance. Experts estimate that millions more Americans joined the ranks of the uninsured during the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, Texas had the highest uninsured rate in the nation, 18%, or about 5 million people. Branham interviewed Leticia Parker, an African-American certified nursing assistant working in home health care. 
Like so many of the working poor, Parker had to struggle with her expenses and could not afford health insurance or to get regular medical checkups. You have to think about a place to live, something to eat, and gas to get back and forth to work, she said. One night, she discovered a lump and sought care at a Houston clinic charging fees on a sliding scale. The diagnosis of malignant cancer qualified her for a special Medicaid program, which allowed her to have the lump and 33 lymph nodes surgically removed, followed by chemotherapy and radiation. She lost partial use of one arm as a result and ended up no longer being able to work and living in a shelter. In addition to appearing in William Branham's interview of himself and St. Mei Ching, Dr. Jaw traveled with William Branham and commented during some of the segments. During the U.S. segment, Dr. Jaw commented in part, I reject that dichotomy that somehow you have to have 20 to 25 percent uninsured people if we're going to have a really highly innovative health care system. There are many reasons to reject that. Take a state like Massachusetts where I live. It's also very dynamic with incredible innovations happening. And yet pretty much everybody in Massachusetts is covered. Look, innovation, there is a cost to it. It does raise the spending of health care. That is a reality. But we can afford to pay for innovation and still make sure everybody's covered. United Kingdom All UK residents pay taxes to the government to support the National Health Service. The NHS is a single payer for health care, paying doctors and hospitals and covering nearly all costs. The National Health Service was built from the wreckage of World War II, something of a gift to a battered and impoverished nation which welcomed it. Today, the NHS is considered the UK's great equalizer. Everyone, regardless of profession or income, has access to that system, including primary care and, as needed, the full range of specialty services. Despite these benefits, the NHS spends less than half per person than the US. Administrative costs are also lower. The NHS generally gets better health outcomes than the US, with longer life expectancies and lower disease rates. The NHS is very much beloved in the UK. There is some disillusion with the NHS. Some residents are on waiting lists for elective procedures. About 10% of residents have purchased private insurance to avoid long waits. Tens of thousands have gone abroad to avoid the waits. Funding for the NHS has continually been a persistent problem and a political flashpoint. Different administrations have funded the NHS at different levels. Recent UK austerity measures have delayed upgrades to the NHS and have worsened staffing shortages. The NHS's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, whose work has been likened to a death panel in the US, examines the evidence for any given treatment or procedure and weighs which ones give the most cost-effective benefits for patients. During a UK segment, Branham interviewed Olive Parfit, an elderly resident of Dorchester who has a bad knee. Knee replacement surgery was scheduled, then canceled 14 hours before the procedure, and Parfit had been on an elective procedure waiting list ever since for nearly a year. She had to take four painkillers before taking a walk around her apartment complex. Walking on the bad knee for over a year had started to throw out the other knee. Parfit lamented, If I have a heart attack tomorrow, it's the best thing. They will take me in. They will do it. But when you've got what I'll call disabilities that are not life-threatening, they can't cope. Parfit has paid into the NHS all her working life. But now, since she's an old girl, NHS is not there now when she needs them. When asked during their interview why something like the NHS, like the proposed Medicare for All, can't gain more traction in the U.S., Sam Mei Cheng replied in part, In the single-payer system, government sets prices, and that is their main cost containment tool, price setting. In America, hospitals, doctors, pharmaceutical companies, they are very, very strong and powerful. 
So here you have the political reality of a very powerful supply side against a Congress that accepts their political contributions. Dr. Ja added in part, you have a Congress, House, up for election every two years, and in almost every congressional district, the biggest employer is the hospitals. You can't do price control very well in the context when everybody's incentive is to get money to hospitals. Switzerland. Switzerland has a universal private health insurance setup in which about 60 health insurance companies drive. The Swiss shop for health insurance like they shop for groceries with a wide array of choices. This cheese or that? A policy with a high premium or high deductible? Health insurance in Switzerland is costly, with each family spending about 16% of their income on health insurance. The Swiss also pay more out of pocket for co-pays, etc. Everyone is covered in a spirit of social solidarity similar to the UK's, which treats health care as a basic right. The Swiss like buying into a system that covers everyone. The Swiss separate health insurance from employment, which means losing a job does not affect health insurance. The government regulates the system requiring all insurance plans to meet basic essential coverage standards while also regulating medication and procedure pricing. The Swiss health system reflects the same high quality as other Swiss products like chocolate, cheese, watches, etc. The Swiss have the choice of any doctor or hospital. The Swiss live an average five years longer and are a lot healthier than Americans with lower chronic disease rates. The Swiss health insurance requirement has sharper teeth that bite into the paycheck of any Swiss who refuse to buy health insurance. The Swiss offer subsidies for lower income workers to buy insurance. The Swiss have an annual expense cap that helps people to avoid bankruptcy from medical bills. Switzerland looks out for those who are often left out in the U.S. and the U.K., including homeless and other people. One of William Branham's interviewees in Switzerland was an American teacher named Jason Preston, who moved to Switzerland and married a Swiss woman named Sabine, pronounced Sabine. Jason said regarding health care, for me, it's a basic right, and they seem to appreciate that. Coming from where I come from, there's this sort of negativity in the States that, you know, if you're poor, then it's almost that you deserve to die, right, for being poor. That's kind of the feeling, the vibe that's given off. That if you can't afford it, well, you don't deserve to be well. Here, it's a bit more humane. It's like, you know, there's a basic level of care that people deserve. It costs, but you still deserve it. And I think that the Swiss government's commitment to that is spot on. During the Switzerland segment, Dr. Ja commented on a major cultural difference between Americans and the Swiss, and that is kind of the rule-following mentality of the Swiss, that the government says, you must buy health insurance, and everybody says, yes, okay, we will buy health insurance, as opposed to in America, where we bristle when the government tells us we have to do anything. And we bring up the broccoli argument. What if the government makes you eat broccoli? The Swiss don't worry about eating broccoli. If the government thinks we ought to do something, we'll do it. In the interview portion following the Switzerland segment, William Branham asked Sane Mei Ching for her thoughts regarding the insurance mandate being crucial to Switzerland's success, to which she replied, It is a crucial part, because for a universal insurance plan to work, you need to have the broadest base from which to collect premiums. You need to have this stool that's held up by three legs. First leg is the mandate. Second leg is guaranteed issue, that you can't turn people away. The insurance companies must accept anyone that comes to them for insurance. And the third one, which is really important, is that you must have adequate government subsidies to people who need help to pay for their health insurance premiums. Australia Australia has a hybrid health care system with public coverage as the base and private insurance on top of it. 
Australia's public system, known as Medicare, is paid for by taxes and available to all Australians and permanent residents. About half of all Australians skip the public system and purchase private health insurance to get around the waiting lists of the public system and to take advantage of the various perks available under the private system. Users of the private system get to have elective procedures when they want them instead of having to wait for them. The public and private systems are meant to work together with the private system taking pressure off of the busier public one. Health outcomes are good for both systems, with Australians living longer and healthier lives. Australia spends about half per person compared to the U.S. Costs are kept low partially because the government sets prices for drugs, treatment, and other expenses. Before the pandemic, more and more Australians were dropping private insurance, straining the rest of the system, causing the government to spend $5 billion a year on subsidies to encourage the purchase of private insurance. It has been said that the $5 billion per year should instead be spent on caring for indigenous groups who die on average of 11 years earlier than other Australians due to discrimination. In the interview portion following the Australia segment, William Branham asked Ms. Chang and Dr. Jha if having a universal health care system helps in fighting a pandemic. Dr. Jha replied in part, Having a universal system does not automatically mean you'll be able to handle a pandemic well. Not having one certainly hampers it. Ms. Cheng added, I'll give you a concrete example. Taiwan, which has this high-performing single-payer system, 99.9% .9 of the people are insured. To date, they have lost nine people to COVID, and total number of cases is under 1,000. 985, something like that. That low number of cases, that has to do with other aspects of how Taiwan's government managed the health care crisis. Canada. Each of the 13 Canadian provinces and territories has its own taxpayer-funded single-payer public health care system, which pays most of the expenses for patient care, including most expenses of COVID patients during the pandemic. Supplemental private health insurance picks up the cost of drugs and other expenses not covered by the public system. Aggressive contact tracing, along with very costly penalties for violating health orders, have helped to enable Canada to better control the spread of COVID during the pandemic. During the pandemic, Canada's death rate has been about three times lower than the U.S. A universal health care system has all partners working together as opposed to a public-private division of responsibility. Unlike hospitals in the U.S., which often compete against one another, a board distributes patients among available space in hospitals and thus avoids situations in which hospitals may be overrun with patients, as has happened in the U.S. Problems occur when a nation gets universal health care, then does nothing further than that. Like the U.S., Canada has experienced many disparities in its health care system. Long-term care facilities, most not part of the public health care system, have seen 70% of COVID deaths. Marginalized and racialized communities have also seen numerous deaths from the COVID pandemic. Between complicated negotiations with vaccine manufacturers and a failure to invest in its own vaccine development capability have put the acquisition and distribution of vaccines in Canada far behind the U.S. Many Canadians become very angry when they hear U.S. politicians demonize the Canadian health care system. They are at a loss to understand the hostility among some in the U.S. to the idea of universal health care. In the interview segment following the Canada segment, William Branham asked Ms. Chain what she would suggest to the Biden administration to get more people covered given the current U.S. political realities. Ms. Chain replied, Most immediately, we could help strengthen the Affordable Care Act, raise the income level of subsidies that we will give 
so that this will allow more people to be able to buy health insurance. That's number one. And number two is that the administration should work with states to expand Medicaid, the program for the poor. Texas, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia have not expanded Medicaid. So if we could get one or two or three or maybe all four, we would have made big strides in getting more Americans covered. Millions. Safety Net Hospitals in Crisis About a month after the PBS NewsHour released Critical Care America vs. the World, PBS Frontline released The Healthcare Divide during May 2021. The program was the culmination of a year-long effort by Frontline and the National Public Radio, or NPR, to better understand why the safety net hospitals around the United States, the hospitals primarily responsible for taking care of America's most needy and vulnerable patients, are either facing profound financial struggles to keep their doors open, or are in fact closing their doors in large numbers. And yet, even during the pandemic, the for-profit hospital chains are reporting enormous profits. The program centered its attention primarily on the example of Erlinger Hospital System in Chattanooga, Tennessee. During the course of the program, a history lesson is presented to the viewer regarding how the current nationwide crisis developed over the last 50 years. Beginning shortly after the federal Medicare and Medicaid programs were started in 1965, for-profit hospital corporations saw an opportunity to make money by taking the more profitable patients, the healthy ones, away from the existing non-profit hospitals across the nation. In a move that some would describe as resembling vultures and buzzards circling above, waiting for an animal to die so as to consume its carcass, the for-profit hospital chains began either buying non-profit hospitals and or building for-profit hospitals. This pattern has now resulted in the for-profit hospital chains raking in profits from the more profitable patients while leaving the safety net hospitals holding the bag with most of the burden of taking care of the less profitable patients, the poor, and the uninsured. The fact that governments have not been successful in adequately funding the safety net hospitals only makes matters worse, causing many safety net hospitals to go under. A six-year expansion project by Erlinger in an attempt to attract more profitable patients in the end did not succeed in resolving the hospital system's financial woes. The city of Chattanooga was approached by a private equity firm, Prospect Medical Holdings, about buying Erlinger, but investigations revealed numerous problems and issues with patient care at Prospect's own hospitals in California, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Among the issues at the Rhode Island hospitals was the fact that Prospect did not make sure needed medical supplies were on hand. Even worse, staff at the Waterbury, Connecticut hospital reported being told to use paper towels, yes, paper towels, to clean and bathe patients. In the view of many, this is typical of a pattern of private equity firms buying safety net hospitals, cutting corners with patient care, and borrowing huge sums of money to pay lucrative dividends to their shareholders despite owing the debt. Episode 3 Summary We began this Episode 3 by discussing the fears associated with medical bankruptcy and Medicaid estate recovery, and how the fears associated with medical bankruptcy have in some instances been realized, regardless of whether the people involved had health insurance or not. In the U.S. Healthcare History section, we discussed how minorities of color have been the targets of mistaken myths, medical experimentation, segregated and or inferior medical care, or denials of medical care altogether. In the Commonality 6, Inequities in Minority Health Care section, we discussed how people with disabilities have likewise been the targets of mistaken myths, medical experimentation, denials of medical care, and of segregative institutionalization on a massive scale. As some have claimed that medical bankruptcy and Medicaid estate recovery would no longer be issues if the United States were to adopt a single-payer health care system like the UK's or Canada's, we compared the health care systems of the U.S., the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Australia, 
and Canada with the help of PBS's Critical Care, America versus the World. Even though most of the other systems compared are significantly cheaper to operate and have significantly better health outcomes, it was found that the grass is not necessarily greener on the single-payer side of the fence. Elective procedure waiting lists and other issues have created difficulties for UK, Australia, and Canada residents. The profound difference between Americans and the Swiss is shown in the vehement rejection of health insurance mandates by Americans versus their acceptance by the Swiss. The overall cost of health care is significantly impacted by the presence or absence of government price controls that makes a difference between medical suppliers and manufacturers only being allowed to charge a set price or being allowed to charge whatever exorbitant amount they want. The level of government funding of health care and the funding practices in any given nation determine the level of difficulty in providing health services, especially to those least able to afford health care, as shown in the unsustainable financial situations faced by many safety net hospitals in the U.S. There are a number of ways that society at large has viewed the distinguishing characteristics of various minorities. Initially, society has invariably seen the distinguishing characteristics of minorities as rendering minorities totally incapable and thus inferior to society at large, clearly as more than a mere characteristic or even a nuisance. The progression of each minority toward equality has prompted a realization, at least on the part of most, that the characteristic does not at all reflect the minority's possibilities of success. Even in the case of those who are blind or those with disabilities, it has become an increasingly common realization that blindness or disability may be a nuisance but does not at all mean total inability, as will be explored in our next episode, Episode 4.